because my rhythm's just a little bit off, you know. I'll get going, and it's out there somewhere. So I get that with my clapping, too. So it's all good. We like it. It's all good because you know why it's all good? God because is good. God is good, and this is the way God created me. That's right. That's right. He did. I am just being who God created me to be. No rhythm. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a part of this awesome, awesome church family. You know, we wanted to sing Rise and Shine this morning because I feel like we need a little sunshine somewhere around here. With the dreariness of the weather that we've had, we need some sunshine. So if the sun isn't going to shine outside, we need to let the sun shine in our hearts so we can bring that brightness into the world. So we're going to sing some great songs this morning. First one is Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. You know, he's going to lead us if we'll follow. He will lead us. We've just got to follow him. So let's stand and let's sing with a joyful and a grateful heart. Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures, lead us for our needs are both prepared. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought us like we are. Blessed Jesus. Hymn number 546, if you're using the book. <laughs> I can't see the other. I have to use a book. Love lifted me. I 
was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deep he stayed within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. This is my Bible. It's God's holy word. It's given to teach me truth, to reprove me of sin, to correct me when I'm wrong, and instruct me in what is right. It's a lamp into my daily walk and a light into my eternal path. And if I hide his words in my heart, then I will not sin against God. <laughs> amen. Amen. Have a seat if you would. It's good to see you and uh, all of you. And uh, good to have us a group of children here. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's what you do. Great. But we're a little weak in our first service this morning. That's okay. We're here. And so we're going to have service. We're strong. That's right. We're strong. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> just a couple of announcements. First of all, there will be service tonight at 6.30. I'll be teaching out Leviticus again. And you're not going to miss this one. Oh, my goodness. It's good. Uh, but that's tonight at 6.30. And then um, you ought to read, I'll tell you what, in preparation, you ought to read Leviticus 13 when it talks about all the pussy sores and all that kind of stuff. You're going to enjoy this message tonight. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, what else? We've got, uh, if you uh, can help with uh, some food for our, our volunteer uh, builders who are be coming in uh, at the end of the week, right? At the end of this week, they'll be coming in. Uh, first and next first and next. A week from Monday, they start. So uh, we've got to get ready for them. Look at Rick. I mean, he just jumped up and down. Did you see that when I yeah, said that? Yeah, he's correcting your date. It's Saturday. He's got a trail off Thursday coming Saturday. Yeah. But Monday, they start. Monday, they start. Monday, they start. So we're ready. But, uh, or say we're ready. Yes, Faye? Would you also tell them that we need Gatorade? The small bottles of Gatorade? Zero. They like Gatorade Zero. Any, so we don't need water. We just need Gatorade. So if you're out and you can pick up an extra six-pack or a case of Gatorade, that'd be great. That'll help us out. And uh, we've got to do that. And we still need people to sign up to bring food. So see, Faye, if you can help with that. Right, Faye? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So need you to help with that. So, All right. And then be ready to volunteer as they could use your help. Uh, next week, not this week. We, we still have some things to do this week, though, right, Rick? So uh, anytime you can come and help, come up and uh, be here, we'd love for you to be here. So You can see Rick between services. If there's some kind of special time you want to come, he'll set that up with you. Okay, good. All right. Uh, 
I think, uh, of course, VBS is just a couple of weeks away too, so we've got that going on. So we, we've got a lot happening in the next couple of weeks, or next three weeks, we've got a lot of things happening. So uh, be ready to get involved. That's all I can tell you. Don't sit on the sidelines. Find your spot and get involved. Um, I think that's all. Boy, have we had the rain. Amen? Amen. Ruby and I went to Longview yesterday, drove up in the rain, drove back in the rain. I mean, it just rained and rained and rained. And uh, the rivers are up, the lakes are up, everything's up. Yep, okay, I'm done. Brother, come lead us to the next song. Let's stand together. If you're using the hymn book, it's number 484. And with all this rain, this is where we want to be on higher ground. <laughs> I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, oh, Where doubts arise and fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. Satan's thoughts and me are old, for faith has fought the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I pray till heaven I found, Lord lead me on to higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane. That I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Please be seated.
Reuben and I had the opportunity yesterday to uh, spend some time with my in-laws, her siblings. They get together about twice a year, seems like, and they get together and spend about four or five hours telling stories on each other. It's kind of a lot of fun. And uh, hearing all the things that they did growing up, they come from a family of 10, so there's a bunch of stories. One thing that I, I love about being a part of that family is over the years, over 50 years, I've been a part of that family to see how God has grown each of us in certain ways. Whereas maybe 20, even 25 years ago, it would have been uncomfortable to sit with my sister-in-law and visit about things of God. Yesterday, it was so comfortable as we shared and talked about the blessings God has brought to our families. And uh, we are just blessed. And I say that to tell you basically about where we're going in this message. Unity is a blessing. Amen. Unity is a blessing. Whether it be in a family, a work uh, atmosphere, a home, or a church, unity is a blessing. And it needs to be protected. And it needs to be worked on. It's like a marriage. You protect your marriage, but you've got to work on it too. It takes all of that. So uh, if you will, take your Bibles, Romans chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 13 through 23 this morning. As you turn there, let me just lead us in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, I thank you again for this day. And I pray, Father, in the next several moments that you'll take and use this message to accomplish what you want to as we gather together as we want, Father, more than anything, to have that unity of spirit that will bring the blessings you have for us as individuals and as a church. And we love you and thank you, Father, for the promise of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me check one thing. Just It's on my heart, and I'm thinking if I don't check it and then I find out it wasn't right, then I would be in trouble. So we're good. I'm just going to leave that there. Paul's teaching us how to maintain unity. He's led us all the way, or he's led the Roman church, he's led the Romans through salvation, through uh, their uh, connection with Judaism and Judaism with uh, Gentile Christians, and uh, then he stepped into uh, how we are to function together. And remember, he began in chapter 12 when he called upon us to. Uh, be living sacrifices. And I'm going to tell you, that is key to everything he teaches from chapter 12 on. If you haven't learned to be a living sacrifice, then you'll struggle with these things that he teaches us even now. But here he's talking about how do we maintain unity among Christians. Now, realize, as we talked about, in a Christian community, you have a lot of different people. Amen? You have early, new, new Christians that are just beginning their walk. They haven't even memorized the first scripture yet, but they're saved. And then you have those old crusties, you know, that have been around forever that can quote half the Bible, but they're all ganged up into one church, one family. We have every different culture that we come from. We have all the different uh, families that we come from, and we all bring our baggage to church, and we've got to figure out some way that we can unify, even though we come from so different backgrounds. We have such different personalities. Some are flamboyant and overt and exciting and easy to uh, get to know, and others are introverted and or scared you're going to talk to them. And we, all of that is part of the church community. That's right. That's all. And God says we're to be unified. That's right. Hello. That's a struggle. It's a struggle in a home. with. I grew up in a home of four brothers, four uh, sons, my, my, me and my three brothers. And, you know, just we, we, we have a lot in common. But, boy, we could fight about everything. So you can imagine in a church how easy it'd be for the church to be disjointed and disunified. But God wants us to be unified. Paul divides this large section into four general categories. And let me give these to you. Number one, we talked about this last week, we are to receive one another. If we're going to maintain unity, we've got to learn to receive one another. 
Why? Because first of all, God receives us just like we are. And also because the Lord sustains us as a church, as individuals, because the Lord is sovereign to each of us, and because the Lord alone can judge us. He's the only judge, not us, him. The second point, and we're dealing with, that, with this today, is how that verses uh, 13 through 23 is the idea that we are to build upon each other. We're to encourage each other. We're to, the, the unity is built as we build together. Everyone's important. Not only are we to receive each other, but we are to do that which constructively edifies each other, strengthening and building up each other. Well, you can see how that's going to build unity as you have, you have um, um, interaction with each other. And you struggle through those personality conflicts. You struggle through those cultural differences. And you find a way to build and to, build and to be built by each other. It is constructive edification that we'll deal with this morning. Then in the next couple of weeks, we'll deal with Romans 15 verses 1 through 7 where we are to please each other. And then Romans 15, 8 through 13 where we are to rejoice with each other. And we'll get into those in the weeks to come. So understand this. We receive one another with understanding. We build up one another without offending. We please one another with Christ as our example. And we rejoice with each other because of the wonder of God's plan. It makes for a unified church when we do all four. Now, as Christians bought under the blood of Jesus Christ, we are saved by grace. We grow in that grace as we mature as his children. And what Paul is dealing with especially is the, the difference between the weak and the, and the strong, between the immature and the mature. But again, as we come together, some of you have been saved short time, a year maybe, or less than a year. Others have been saved 50, 60 years. And there's a big divide. And Paul's telling us in this particular situation that we've got to build upon each other. We need to learn how to help the weaker, and the weaker needs to learn how to get along with the mature. And there's a way to do that, and we're going to look at that this morning. It's, as I, as, as, as for, for the legalist, the newly born Christian, many times legalism is a, is a thing. They, they, they've been taught all their lives, you're going to go to heaven because you're good enough. And although they receive Christ as their Savior by grace, they still feel like they've got to do something. And so they, they get comfortable with a system of legalism so they can point to themselves and say, well, see, I, I wear my hair the way I'm supposed to. I, I wear the dress I'm supposed to. I, I, you know, I do all the things I'm supposed to. And somehow that, and, and it's a good, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it satisfies in them the fact that they're growing, that they have been saved and now they are living for Christ. But if they get stuck in that and they fail to understand the freedom of grace and the liberty God gives us, then they fail to grow. They get stuck. And they look at those who have the freedom of grace as somehow infringing on the grace of God by their libertarianism, I guess you'd say. For those who claim maturity, the restrictions of the legalists put on life are seen as constrictive and immature, and they want to put them down because of that. According to Paul, neither attitude is correct. God is the master and judge, not us. We are all bought with a price, and our allegiance is to him. Our freedoms are before God. Our liberty is before God. Whether we exercise it or not is not the matter. I may in my own heart feel I'm free to do many things that I may never do simply because I don't want to do those things just to prove I'm strong. I don't need to do that. And I find many times those who want to walk in the liberty of Christ, they want to flaunt their liberty as if, well, look at me, I'm stronger than you. If that's the case, you need to examine your strength. You need to examine your maturity, amen? And that's what Paul's going to deal with here. We shouldn't, I, I, we need rather, instead of trying to prove our maturity through our liberty, is to prove our maturity through our love for each other. 
and taking care of each other. My liberty is vertical. My liberty that I have in Christ is between me and Him. That's where that liberty lies. It's he, what I enjoy in my heart before the Lord. In my, and uh, in my heart before the Lord, I know I have certain freedoms. But the exercise of that liberty is horizontal because it's between person and another person. And in that way, it's limited by my love for them and my love for God. So my, my liberty is vertical, but my exercise of that liberty has to be horizontal. How does it affect those around me? Let's look at Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him that with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Let me give you five ways that we are not to offend, or five ways to maintain the unity in the church. Number one, do not cause a brother to stumble. Verse 13 and 14, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather. Let no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. First of all, he says, do not judge your brother. Whether weak or strong, it's not your, it's not your job to judge. It's not for you to put that tag on them as whether or not they are accepted or not accepted by God, or their actions are accepted or not accepted by God. Now again, we're not talking about overt sin, we're talking about those generalities, those, those gray areas that people love to try to, to figure out, and, and uh, they, uh, I'll deal with this in a minute, they, they, they take preferences and make doctrines out of them. They take things that are non-essential and try to make them essential. And yet God's word has essentials. God's word has the things that we're to build conviction on. But when we're dealing with things that just are simple, those things that are, are gray areas, those that uh, are controversial in the church, we need to accept the fact that sometimes we cause others to stumble whenever we try to make those essential when really God just says, hmm, maybe you ought to look at it a little differently. Guard against being that stumbling block to your brother. You may be the strong and your weaker brother comes along and sees you doing something or being involved in some activity that they feel is wrong. And by you continuing to do that, you may cause them to stumble. Which is more important, your liberty or causing a brother to stumble? So clean to you may not be clean to your brother. Well, how do you deal with this issue? Because I'm going to tell you, I grew, I've grown up in the church, and I've been in the church a long time. And I've been, been down the road of legalism, and I've watched and seen. I tell you right now, we could go to every church in America and get them to send us their Sunday school teacher qualifications. And we could make up a list of things that you're not supposed to do and things you're supposed to do that could fill this room. And many of those things are preferences. 
They're not based upon the doctrine of God's word, but instead preferences. Why I was taught, and I've shared this with you before, that uh, if your hair touches your ear as a man, you're living in sin. Well, hello. I have been taught that you gals want to walk around in your pants and pantsuits. Now you stretch your pants. Well, you just <laughs> send up a storm because you're wearing that which pertaineth to a man. The only problem with that, what my wife wears, I'm not about to wear, amen. <laughs> I've been taught that it's wrong to have wire rim glasses. Can you believe that? Or to have pierced ears on women and on men. I've been taught so many things. I mean, there's a list of rules that just goes beyond what you can imagine. But you know what? God's more concerned about the individual than about all these Things. How do we deal with this? Because I, I came to a place where I had so many things to where literally you, it was going to be impossible to even live without violating somebody's rules. And I thought, is this the way I'm supposed to live? I mean, if I'm supposed to yield to my weaker brother all the time and my weaker brother keeps coming up with all these things, where is my life going to be? Where will it stop? So let me give you two things you can do. First of all, Stop what you're doing. Ask yourself this. What is the value of this activity in my life? How much, how much value do I put upon it? If it's not something you're willing to give up for the sake of your weaker brother, you have put a high value on that action. And you need to ask yourself, is it legitimate? Is it something God says, yes. Sometimes I believe you're put in this position to help grow a weaker brother. So this brings me to my second way to deal with this. Try to encourage a brother in his understanding. Scripture, or let me give you a scripture for that. 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your conversation in Christ. You say, was Christ ever guilty of that? Well, let's just think for a second. Was Christ ever accused of violating the law? Yeah. Oh, I think he was. Was he violating the law? No. But to them, it was wrong. And guess what? To them, it was still wrong. Even though Christ was doing it. We have to, we, and, and Christ would try to teach them out of that thought. He would say, but wait, this is, this is not right, what you're thinking. This is the way it ought. And I think sometimes we as a mature Christian, we need to stop when somebody is questioning, somebody's having a struggle with an activity or with a thought or, or something maybe you said or something, and they come and they say, you know, it really bothers me that you believe that. And you say, okay, let's look at Scripture. Let's see where we find that in Scripture. Where do we find that that's wrong in Scripture? And we may find something. In the Old Testament, listen, if you're with me in Leviticus, we're talking about a lot of stuff, aren't we? Woo, my goodness. I mean, you just, uh, you ate shellfish today. I tell you what, you just are wrong. Well, would it be right for me then to give up shellfish for my weaker brother? Or would it be better that I say, let's talk about that. Let me talk to you about the grace that God's given as Christ has satisfied the law. Let me teach you that so that you're not stuck in that. Instead of just saying, okay, well, I'll give up shellfish, you know. Right. Or, well, like tonight, I'll talk about leprosy. You get a little spot on you, you've got to go be set with the priest for seven days and find out if it's going to turn into real leprosy or not. Well, you know, we can make a big deal out of that. I think there's times when we've got to say, it doesn't matter, I'll give it up. And there's many things that I've done in my life I, I would like to do or maybe I would choose to do that I don't see anything wrong with, but I won't do because of the position I have as a pastor that might in some way offend a weaker brother. I am concerned about that. 
But there is a place where I would stop and say, hold it. I think you've gone a little far on that. Let's talk about what the scripture says. And I think that's what we need to do. All right, let's go on to the next thing. Uh, verse 15. First, do not cause your brother to stumble. Then secondly, do not devastate your brother. Romans chapter 14, verse 15 says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, thou walkest thou not charitably. Destroy to him that with, the, with thy meat for whom Christ died. It says a brother grieved by our action is an indication that we're limiting or we're limited in our love for them. Doesn't it say that? Now walkest thou not charitably? If my weaker brother is offended by something I do, then maybe I'm not walking in love. I'm not caring about that weaker brother. He says, be careful. Check out your action. Check out your motives behind it. Destroy not him, he says. This is one of God's children. And he's been purchased by the blood of Christ. What kind of value do you think God has on this one person? You know, if, if you take a magic marker and go into a museum that's filled with priceless art. You ready? Take your magic marker and go in, and there's a Picasso, valued at, well, outside my realm of value, it's priceless as far as I'm concerned. And I walk up to it and say, you know, I think it'd look better if I just add a little mark in here, and I take my magic marker and I mark on it. And I go to the next one, and I say, here's a, what's it, who's another great artist? Rembrandt. There's a Rembrandt. And, uh, you know, I think Rembrandt may have missed it right here. Let me just add, I want to add a funny face right here. I think it'd look a lot better. And I go to the next one, and I, I find a spot on it, and he, he didn't get that color right here. Let me just take that magic marker. What have I done? I've just destroyed something that in the eyes of artists was already perfect. Let me tell you what I do whenever I'm not concerned about a weaker brother. Because that weaker brother has been bought with a price. God is working in his life. God's preparing him. God's creating a great painting of that man's life or that woman's life. And I come along and say, let me help you, God. Hang on. We might destroy our brother. You get it? We need to be careful how we deal with those that may not be as mature as we think we are. Number three. Do not forfeit your witness. He says, verse 16, 17, Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Man, that's a great verse. Do not forfeit your witness by overdoing your liberty and offending your brother in the face of an unbeliever. The unbeliever needs to see you loving your brother by your actions. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, 16 says this, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. My liberty is not for me to flaunt it. My liberty is not for me to push it on somebody else. My liberty is not to be in such a way of marking up another person's life. And then the unbeliever sitting there going, I can't believe that you call yourself a mature Christian and this is the way you act. This is the way you treat your weaker brother. This is the way you treat somebody that's trying to learn how to be a Christian. We do not need to show the world how free we are. You should know that. You don't have to prove anything. You are free. You've been bought with the prize. You've been graced with the grace of God. Like Paul said, there's, there's nothing that's offensive. There's nothing that he finds that's uh, outside the bounds of legalism for him. And why? Because he walks in the grace of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't have to prove it to anybody. Concentrate instead on the essentials of building up those around you. People want to, I'm mature, you know, I can have a drink of wine and I'm mature, I can go to this place and I'm mature because I don't have to be in church all the time. I'm mature because, you know, and they walk around claiming their maturity and the truth is they are missing out on the essentials. They're so wrapped up in themselves and what they can do that they forget about the people that are watching them that are trying to learn to grow as Christians. That's why I say you need to concentrate on the essentials. 
Verse 18 to 19 says, For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Concentrate on the essentials, the things that make peace, not the things that divide, the things that unify. Things wherewith one may edify another, work on building each other up, work on growing each other. That's what we should concentrate on. Do not forfeit your witness. And then number four, do not pull down the work of God. Verse 20 says, for meat destroy not the work of God. Now remember, he's dealing with the meat that's offered to idols and how that uh, the Jews look at that. They would never eat meat offered to idols. And those who came out of idol worship, they may put that as a legalism because it reminds them of the meat that they, they ate that was offered to idols. And so they wouldn't eat it. And Paul is basically saying, y'all made a big deal out of something that's not a big deal. Don't pull down the work of God for meat that has no eternal value either way. Concentrate on the things that really matter. There are those who are insistent upon proving their point that they will literally destroy the work of God. You know what? I learned a long time ago the difference between conviction and preference. You know what the difference is? Conviction you'll fight and die for. Preference, not so. Conviction we fight and die for. We are to contend for the faith. Jude says this, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? For there are certain men crept in unawares. These were the apostates. They are the apostates today. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly man, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We stand on those convictions. We fight and die over the inerrancy of Scripture. We fight and die over the virgin birth. We fight and die over the blood uh, being the only remission of sin. We fight and die over those things. But I'm not going to fight and die over the length of your hair. Amen? I'm not going to fight and die on whether or not you wear a tie to church or not. Or a white shirt, believe it or not, that was one of them. If you don't wear a white shirt to church, you're just not right with God. I'm not going to fight and die over something like that. But I will fight and die over the inerrancy of Scripture. I will fight and die over the fact of the, of the virgin birth. Those are convictions. But preferences? No. We refuse to fight over those. So why make them such a big deal? Be sure what the Bible teaches about the subject before you make it a conviction. Many times what we fight over are mere preferences, things that are non-essentials. I promise you the majority, I, I, the majority, I'd say 99% of church splits are not based on a biblical conflict. It's based on a preference. The color of the carpet, the way the pastor Parks his car, I, you know, I just anything. The music. the music, yeah, preferences instead of the convictions. Make, you know, make mountains out of the mountains, but don't make mountains out of molehills. And then lastly, don't, do not flaunt your liberty. Verse 20 goes on to say, All things indeed are pure, Paul says, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor drink wine, nor anything whereby the brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Your liberty may be grounded in truth, but it can be evil if it causes a brother to stumble. So which do you choose? Your liberty flaunted as some kind of proof that you are mature in your Christian walk, causing a fracture in the church? Or a life living peaceably and helping a weaker brother building unity. You make the choice. Pretty simple, isn't it? We should work to build up, to encourage, to not offend our weaker brother. The verses go on, verse 22 and 23, and he begins and said, Hast thou, hast thou faith? Don't you have faith? How do you demonstrate your faith? Have it to thyself before God. 
First of all, be satisfied with your position in Christ. Be satisfied with your position in Christ. You know what I find? Most immature Christians, most weak Christians, they find great um, comfort when they can have a rule that they obey. And I understand that. I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying that that's, that's where they find their comfort. They find comfort with the boundaries. They find comfort when there's a rule and I can stay inside that rule. When my children were growing up, and I've shared this before, when we lived in, uh, we had a little house there in Longview. In the backyard, we had a swing set. We had everything out there for them to play on, and they wouldn't go out there and play. We moved to California, and we moved into a house that had a six-foot Haydot block wall all the way around that backyard. We couldn't keep them out of that backyard. You know what the difference was? One had boundaries, the other didn't. They felt safe with the boundaries. But giving them the liberty to be able to go and do further, they didn't feel safe. And I know this is true with immature Christians, for weak Christians, for those struggling in their walk with God. This is many times where they get hung up. They want to know hard, fast, right, wrong, do, don't do. They like that. But there's some places that are left to us to decide as Christians. And we have to make some decisions. That's part of maturity, isn't it? You know, when you were a little kid, mom and dad told you what to eat, where to go, what time to go to bed, everything. But as you got older, you didn't want to be treated that way. Why? Because you were maturing. And now that you're an adult, you don't want anybody telling you what to do. Amen. I know that's true. But, but that's part of maturing is making good decisions in Christ, learning what grace is. Learning what it is to live in that liberty that God's given you without violating the boundaries, the convictions, is a great place to live. There's such freedom there, and it's enjoyable. But as, as a mature Christian, you've got to understand there are those that are uncomfortable with that as of yet. We've got to learn to get along. Be satisfied with your own position in Christ, not having to make a point of it. Then he says, happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And that just simply saying, be confident in what you believe and why. Like I said in 1 Peter, know the answer if somebody asks you a reason why. N know what you believe and why you believe it. You know, that settles a lot of things right there. Right. And somebody comes along and asks you a question you don't have an answer for. That's just an indication you've got some more growing to do. Amen. That's, right. that's not a put down. I, have, I don't have the answer to that. You know, that's a great question. Let me see if I can find the answer. I need to know that myself. Thank you for sharing with me. You're going to help me grow because of that question. But then be confident of what you believe and why you believe it. And then verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eat is not in faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Basically this, walk in faith. And when in doubt, don't. That's right. It's not hard, this Christian life. Walk in faith. And if you come to that position where you're doubtful as to whether or not you should or shouldn't, just don't. Until you come to that place where you can prove it is good for you or not good for you. I've shared this story before, but I just love this story. I think it was... Um, I think it was Jay Vernon Gee, or it was Warren Wiersbe. It's one of those two preachers. I think it was Jay Vernon. It sounds like Jay Vernon. A young couple had just gotten married, and the fellow came to Jay Vernon and said, Jay Vernon, I need to ask you a question. I have a real problem. My wife and I, we've, uh, we, we, we've grown up, and we've danced and just had a great time dancing. But now I, I realize I'm, I'm a Christian, and I'm living for Christ. I'm trying to live for Christ. Is it right or wrong for me to dance? For us to dance. And Jay Vernon said, It's wrong for you, but it'd be fine for me and my wife. He said, Why why would you say that? Well, because the question you asked makes me aware of the fact this is something you're not sure about. And until you're sure about it, don't do it. But for Jay Vernon, it was settled. Dancing with his wife was okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> Walk in faith, not in doubt. That's the key. That's a sign of maturity, isn't it? Walk in faith, not in doubt. Not flaunting it. Not flaunting your liberty. 
And knowing that if you are hurting somebody or causing somebody to stumble, stop. Until either you stop and say, I give it up, I'll never do that again, or until you have time to sit down with them, instruct them, and maybe so they can understand from Scripture why this is not something that they should be offended by. That's helping a brother. That's building. That's edifying. What would happen if the church took these five things and really applied them? Man, oh man, wouldn't it be an amazing church? No kind of squabbles, no kinds of misunderstanding. We would have what he says here, where we would walk in joy and peace. That's what we want, isn't it? That's what I want. That's unity in the church when those things are there. It all begins, of course, with our knowledge of Christ and then growing in Christ. Don't ever get frustrated with your growing in Christ. Let me just say this. I'll just throw this on just because I got time and because I think it needs to be added. Don't get frustrated in your walk in Christ. You say, well, I, I've, you know, I got saved when I was young and I just never have grown as a Christian and now it just seems like I'm just too old to learn. No, you're not. And you're not too old to grow. You can always grow. There's always room. There's always time. We don't never give up on that. And never get discouraged because we feel like we're not growing fast enough. Be satisfied with where you are and what God's doing with you. Wherever that might be. And don't let some super pious mature thinking Christian come along and, and put you down. You be satisfied that you got saved and the Holy Spirit's working in your life and you're right where God wants you to be right now. Amen. That's where God wants you. That's right. um, the pastor of, of Second Baptist. Help me out. Who's the pastor of Second Baptist Houston? Ed, Ed Young, yeah. Dr. Ed Young wrote a book, and it's uh, the title, it's a title, a subtitle of it is, God loves you just the way you are. He just doesn't want you to stay that way. That's true, isn't it? I don't care where you are in your Christian walk, that's true. You may think you're the most mature Christian ever walked the face of the earth. I can tell you right now, God's got some maturity for you. You may think you're the weakest Christian in the world. You need to understand this. You got, God's got some maturity for you. We ought to all take that little plaque we used to have over our kids' beds. Please be patient with me. God's not through with me yet. Amen. He's not through till he takes my last breath. He's not through with me. And he's not through with you. Don't get frustrated. Don't get discouraged. Always be looking for growth and continue to encourage each other. Whether you think you're strong or weak, encourage each other. It makes no difference. That's what we're to do. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you this morning. For the fact that in Jesus Christ, you began a process of growth for each of us. And Lord, I would pray this morning that we've not stifled that growth in any way. But God, that it just continues to grow. Father, sometimes as we're growing, we're, we're made aware of a, a problem with the brick that we have. It doesn't fit. It's not, it's not what it ought to be. And so we have to do some trimming. We have to do some uh, changing Others of us, Father, we need to be aware of those around us to encourage, to build, to build properly as, as we look for the opportunity to grow as well. Father, this is a great message. This is a message we need to hear this morning as a church and as individuals. And I pray, Father, as we leave here, we'll have a commitment to be involved in each other's lives, to encourage, to build up, not to cause a stumbling block, but to be one who would always have something positive to say about our growth. We love you. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. If you're here and God has spoke to your heart in this message in a special way, and I, and I, hope, I hope he has, I want to pray for you. Would you do me a favor and just raise your hand on me to see? Who can I pray for? Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. God, God bless you. Amen. All of us need to hear this. And Father, I would pray for these who've raised their hands and those, Father, that maybe didn't that should. That we all come to a place of maturing. Wherever we're at, God, may we never be satisfied where we sit in our maturity. Might we always desire to grow closer to you, more like Jesus. 
our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder this morning if there's someone here that said, Brother Jim, I'm not even sure I'm saved. I've heard people talk about being saved. I'm not even sure I understand what that means. But if that's something God has for me, I want it. And I don't want to wait. I want it this morning. I want to settle this. I want that salvation. I want to know for sure that I'm in a personal relationship with my God and that when I die, he's going to take me straight to heaven. I want to know that this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If God speak to your heart about being saved, would you just slip your hand up? Is there someone like that? Amen, buddy. I see you. Is there anybody else? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share the message this morning. And I pray now that as we dismiss, that God, we take this message with us. May we look for those opportunities you give us to grow, to build unity in our church by caring for each other, being consistent in just loving each other. When we see a brother or sister stumble, may we be the first one to come along and pick them up, encourage them. Lord, we love you. Pray for those who may not be saved this morning that today they would find that salvation. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, we're going to dismiss to go to Sunday school. You've got time to go get a cup of coffee and then head off to Sunday school. So if you will, stand to your feet. And uh, Brother Jim, are you going to dismiss us in prayer, brother? Yes, sir. All right. You'll be mad. I appreciate it.